Hello and welcome to New Filmmakers Los Angeles in partnership with Movie Maker Magazine. My name is Danny DeLillo and we're here at the Cambridge Los Angeles show in West Hollywood and I'm here with Brian L. Tan, otherwise known as BLT, with his movie Holdout. Let's take a look at a clip. You know how long you've been out here for? It's been 30 years. I'll tell them you're still here. I'll help you leave this place. Brian, congratulations on your film. Thank you. Did a fantastic job. Thank you. Well, for anyone that hasn't seen Holdout, tell us a brief synopsis. Sure. So Holdout's actually based on a true story. You know the, how they always say truth is stranger than mm -hmm. fiction and life imitates art? Well, this one is very much an example of that. Uh, Holdout's actually based on the true story of Hiro Onada, who was a Japanese soldier, a lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial Army who never surrendered after the war. Mm. So in 1945, he decided, I'm just going to keep on fighting because it's my duty to the emperor, it's a duty to the Japanese people. Mm -hmm. And so he never got the memo that the war ended or choose to ignore it. Wow. And essentially only finally surrendered in real life in 1975. Wow. Finally turned his sword in and was like, okay, I'm finally going home. So uh, that's essentially our story. We're kind of following not exactly that guy, but mm -hmm. someone who was in a similar predicament. And we try to understand why he never surrendered. And obviously that's the sort of backbone of the story, and mm. we added in a lot of extra mm. elements. So it's more inspired by that story as opposed mm -hmm. to being true to it, if that makes sense. And that formed the foundation for Holdout. And it's like 30 years after the war. It's really a very fascinating story. Um, you really did have me on the edge of my seat, like just in this world, in this zone. Where did the inspiration come for you to want to make the film? Well, believe it or not, it all came from Wikipedia. Uh, Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> exactly. <Shout out. laughs> um, it's just one of those things where I just came across this story one day, and it actually happened that the real life guy, Hero, actually passed away, I want to say three years ago, and they had a notable deaths on Wikipedia. And so I was very intrigued, and I clicked on, and that's how I discovered the story. Mm -hmm. And from there, it became a sort of rabbit hole where you're just clicking around on Wikipedia, and five mm -hmm. hours had passed, and I was just so immersed in the story, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't done before. And that to me was such a travesty. Mm -hmm. This is such an amazing rich story, 30 years, mm -hmm. why would he keep on fighting? And that to me, uh, that single question was really sparked the genesis mm -hmm. of why we decided to do this film. And in particular, in our story, we have an interaction between him, you know, he's been on this island for a long time, mm -hmm. and his buddy, his only buddy that he's had since the war ends up dying in the first scene. And then from there, that creates the sort of question that he has of, is it worth going on, mm -hmm. or should I finally go back? And he encounters an American backpacker in the film, and that's sort of our bridge into it, where we understand and try and get empathy for why he's in this situation. And then he has to decide by the end, do I keep going or do I return to Japan? So. It's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. And you created this amazing world. And I love the epic shots that you took us in. And initially, I thought I was watching Jurassic Park because there's all <laughs> these like amazing shots that you brought us in to really give us the essence of where we were and what it was. Right. Um, where did you actually film? Um, funny you mentioned Jurassic Park. We did not have Jurassic Park budgets, but we actually shot where the first Jurassic Park was um, wow. in Hawaii and Oahu. Yeah. And so it was a very interesting situation because we wanted to stick true to the story. Yeah. To go to Philippines, to go mm -hmm. to Malaysia, Guam, somewhere out there. But mm -hmm. as you can imagine, being an independent film, you don't have the budget to fly 10 different people all the yeah. way from Los Angeles all the way there. So we ended up um, sourcing around in Hawaii instead. We met Hawaii's up. not a bad place. Uh, it to could hang be worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a rough life, right? It's a somebody, rough life somebody's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so Hawaii was uh, finally what we decided to choose because it had a great infrastructure. Mm -hmm. A lot of the places, these little tropical islands, you had to mm. fly not just ten people, maybe fifty people in. Mm. Our crew was probably easily about 40, 45 people every day, and out of the apart from the ten people we flew from LA everyone else was a local hire. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And the thing about it is that the Hawaii crew is absolutely phenomenal. I met a producer, Angie LaPrette, Vince Lacero, mm -hmm. uh, Roy Cho, uh, Rick Galendez. These guys are local producers in Hawaii, and they've worked on your Jurassic Parks, your wow. uh, Baywatches, your, um, you know, your big, big uh, King Kong type movies. Yeah. And when they're on hiatus, they're willing to help out small little independent productions That's like That's fantastic. Us. So they help co-sponsor the movie, they threw in all their equipment, their, their labor, their time, their resources, their That's energy. Amazing. Yeah, and so that to me was 
one of the most phenomenal things about Hawaii is that people are so passionate about their craft. They're mm -hmm. willing to, you know, work on their free time on a small little independent project all the way from Los Angeles. And that to wow. me was it's why phenomenal. we chose Hawaii. Yeah, the talent there is is world class. You think that being a little island, they wouldn't mm. be exposed to everything, but the crew from there is, will go toe to toe with anywhere else in the world easily. We're moving to Hawaii. <laughs> that's happening. <laughs> um, I love it. I think, uh, I think our flight leaves right now. Yeah, let's yeah. go, bye. We go? Yeah, right, we'll see you later. We're, we're off. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that's, a real, that's really wondrous to hear. And that's so great when you have these amazing, talented people that want to work with you on, on your film and your film is fantastic. I, what fascinates me is that you as a director, you know, you create this atmosphere, you, whatever conversations you have with your fantastic actors who really created this environment. And it was very, very intense from start mm. to finish. Obviously, tell us about how you find your actors and then tell us sort of as your director, what, what kind of, you know, what you had to explain to them to do to kind of really create this very, very intense atmosphere. Absolutely. I used to be of the philosophy that production value is everything. If you mm -hmm. go back to my older works, they're all about explosions and helicopters and mm -hmm. SWAT teams and all of that. Um, and then I realized a few years ago that you can only have a very compelling story and an equally um, amazing uh, experience mm -hmm. if the acting supports that. Mm -hmm. You know, the acting needs to be as explosive as the literal explosions on the screen. Mm -hmm. So for me, acting was a cornerstone of what made this project possible. Because our hero, um, uh, Matsuo in the film, mm -hmm. he has such a duality to him mm -hmm. where you kind of have to feel sympathetic about him mm -hmm. and feel, okay, I may not be in this predicament, but I empathize with it. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, sort of also feel that he can be a monster if he chooses to be. He mm -hmm. needs to be a man walking that tightrope between insanity and insanity. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, we wanted to choose someone that could display that ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And from there we started casting around. Um, so I don't speak a single word of Japanese and I had to basically make sure that the phonetic translation was going to work for me. So mm -hmm. I had to really trust my actors. Mm -hmm. And I found this guy uh, through a casting director, Toshi Toda. Mm -hmm. He's been in a lot of um, films like Letters from Iwo Jima, um, mm -hmm. Arrested Development, funnily enough. And uh, he was a phenomenal actor and he He's pulled fantastic. off. Yeah, he pulled off that, that sort of um, the ability to sort of be, to sympathize with his plight yet at the same time feel that he is definitely gone a little bit cuckoo at the same yeah. time. <laughs> so I think that is a very fine line mm. that every actor, mm. uh, it's a role that every actor would yearn for and yeah, he absolutely course. excelled at it. Definitely. Um, for the young uh, half white, half Japanese uh, backpacker kid, uh, we found this actor, Mick Talbert, who uh, really had not that much acting experience. This was maybe his second or third role. No. And he's a more known as a famous break dancer. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, totally randomly. Yeah. And so we had him, we casted him because he had a phenomenal audition. Um, our other character, Officer Marcos, was played by Wesley John, who's mm -hmm. a veteran TV and, and movie actor. He just finished on Hawaii Five-0. He's been on Scorpion King and a lot of other films. But wow. our acting was really what made this film possible. It's incredible. Yeah. You had a really great acting uh, yeah. trio that was really fantastic. Um, uh, what would you say was your biggest challenge in making the film? I would say the biggest challenge, um, I'll give you one for each step of the way. Sure. Um, so for pre-production, finding Hawaii, finding the location, finding all that, all those things, because you're kind of trying to operate a production mm -hmm. literally, literally 2,000 miles away, and that was very, mm -hmm. very challenging. But if not for our Hawaii crew, it would have been impossible for us to find them. So mm -hmm. that was the biggest challenge. And production... Oh boy, that was a, it felt like I was filming Apocalypse Now. <laughs> it, was just, it, was, it was insane. Um, mm. It would never stop raining. Uh, there were certain days where the mud was just literally became landslides. You know, forget about continuity. Oh my goodness. Uh, forget about escaping with your skin intact because there's wow. a baz bazillion mosquitoes. Um, we had to like, um, certain days, certain trees had collapsed on places we were going to film. Mm. It had to do a lot of improvisation and mm -hmm. the most of the film is shot handheld. Um, which is part of the artistic choice of mm -hmm. it, but also because we really couldn't bring in any tripods that so would get filled in the mud. We couldn't bring in any um, any cranes, any dollies, none of that, because you couldn't set track down because wow. everything was literally covered in and mud. There's me and thinking grime it was just just a choice, but it worked really well. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very authentic, yeah, and, very much so. And I guess I believe in this thing called method directing. Method directing, yeah, I like which that. Which is, is kind of going into the to the grime, to the mud, and, mm -hmm. and fjording rivers and getting really dirty and grimy yeah. and all that because it really was what the character went through. And if yeah. you go in with that mentality, you embrace the challenge as of course. not so much an obstacle or a problem, 
but more as something that gets you into the headspace of the actor. Mm -hmm. And that to me was really what helped my directing because if it had been on a great uh, sound stage or you know, a really well-dressed location in Los Angeles, you know, when you leave and you go in the back room and you're having your you know, cafe macchiato, you kind of go and separate yourself from the subject. And so yeah. to me, I wanted to be really close to the source. Yeah. And so I kind of turned that challenge to sort of um, a personal project. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, and then post-production, the challenge was, you know, rushing this thing out. We had a big premiere uh, last year. Mm -hmm. um, it was the launch of my startup, mm -hmm. uh, Rapple, as well as the film at the same time. And we invited 600 people to the Crest Theater in Los Angeles, and we set a date months in advance to book the theater without knowing whether or not our film would be done. So we literally wow. finished it like two days before we were supposed to show wow, it. Wow, that yeah. and kind of filmmaking, <laughs> exactly. that's very good. Well, that's yeah. fantastic. Well, I mean, when you have 600 eyeballs waiting and expecting they're waiting something. To, yeah. that, well, congratulations yeah. on that, you're Thank a you. trooper. Um, what is it like then to have, after all the hard work, to have your film selected for New Filmmakers LA and have an audience watch you? What is that feeling like? Well, it's, um, it's obviously an honor. I think um, a lot of filmmakers these days create content mm -hmm. and put their content online, but you have no guarantee whatsoever it's gonna be seen. A film that's not being seen might as well have not been made. And mm -hmm. I know that sounds extremely harsh, but um, eyeballs are everything. And in this day and age, you need to sort of have something that allows you to rise above mm -hmm. the noise, you know, to, mm -hmm. to not be lost in the chatter. Mm -hmm. And I think what New Filmmakers is doing is, is absolutely fantastic because you wouldn't ordinarily be able to have these same kind of exposures. I mean, we did, we pretty much have done, are done with our festival run, and this is probably the last like big screening that we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have that honor and having Andrew and Larry put this all together is a uh, it's absolutely a privilege for us uh, to be a part of it because the opportunities for independent filmmakers, especially in the short film genre, are extremely limited. Mm -hmm. So to have a place and a venue for people to see it is, is something I think is absolutely outstanding. Well, thank you. We're nothing without you guys. We're like, like, fantastic and great talents. Um, you're a, I, I feel like I've learned so much. I feel like I've had like a life coaching session in, in, with we'll you as well. We'll send you the invoice later. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. <laughs> yeah but he's expensive because he says really great stuff. But if you, if you wouldn't mind sure. giving out some free advice to the filmmaking world, what one piece of advice would you give out to a filmmaker that would like to follow into your footsteps and, and, and become a hmm. filmmaker one day? Well, um, I would say I'm not quite where I want to be yet. I'm nowhere even close, maybe 10% there. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm not in a position where I'm the next James Cameron or Martin Scorsese and I'm speaking for a position of authority. So what I'm trying to get at is free advice is freely discarded. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, but from my opinion, my, I think my experiences so far have led me to believe that being stubborn is the penultimate key to succeeding in this industry. I like that. Yeah, and allow me to elaborate. I think you always think that you're going to be that one in a billion filmmaker when you mm -hmm. make that one film and it's going to, you know, Steven Spielberg walks into your random screening and is like, wow, let's hire him. He needs to be on the next big, you know, whatever blockbuster. Mm -hmm. It could happen, but that's one in a billion chance. For the rest of us, the people that need to just strive and want to make it, you really need to have perseverance. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And if you keep on doing it enough times, your talent will eventually get recognized because this industry is not just about hard work and talent. That is an absolute lie. Mm -hmm. You know, they, how they say the American dream is based on meritocracy. Mm -hmm. It is to some extent. So talent and hard work will get you halfway there, mm -hmm. but you still need luck and you still need connections. And those two only come with time. And you need basically those two conf confluencing factors to mm -hmm. come together. And if you're stubborn enough and you work hard enough for long enough, eventually the luck and the connections will catch up to you. And a lot of filmmakers need to realize that it's not just about that one film you made, it's about doing it over and over again. Because creative, creativity is a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. And so you need to keep on going. Creativity is a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. Right. You trademark that one, mister. Yeah. That's a great, that's well, a fantastic Well, I don't actually have quote. any actual muscle, so well, creativity I mean, has to be my We're still own, growing, so. right? We're still growing. <laughs> Um, exactly. It's been tremendous speaking with you. I think that is extraordinarily valuable advice and, and, and it's great that you're able to showcase that in the moving image as well. And uh, I'm very excited to see many more of your films and, uh, and we all look forward to, to either working with you, watching your films or having you as our therapist. So thank yeah. you very much. Either way, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate Cheers. it. Thank you.